Hello and welcome to Perford TVR, Spring Edition 2018. I'm Tim Matthews. Well, on today's programme, we'll be taking a trip over to Woking Golf Club in Hook Heath to learn about that great suffragette composer and writer, Ethel Smythe. We'll visit Perford Social Club to hear and see a performance of that well-known classic, The Perford Song. But we begin with some poetry. A collection, in fact, by local author Kitty Coles. She's not new to writing, but this will be her first published collection. Indeed, many of her poems have already appeared in magazines and literary journals. The first collection is entitled Seal Wife. And if you expected fluffy, anodyne verses to calm your furrowed brow, then you'd be mistaken. Myth and legend, fairy tales and the supernatural are the subjects of her writing. And against all this is a background that is often dark and disturbing. It's nature, all right, but it's red in tooth and claw. Anne Jones went to meet Kitty and began by asking her why the themes of the natural world are so important to her. Yes, um, I, I mean, I love the natural world. I love going for walks. I live very near a country park and I spend quite a lot of time there. Um, I would say that nature in my writing plays a different role to the role it plays in my everyday life, in that while I love nature and like to spend a lot of time in it, in the writing it possibly has quite a sinister role. You know, it's a place where unpleasant things happen and in the writing I focus more on, you know, nature red in tooth and claw, if you like, that side of things. Many of your poems are inspired by Celtic mythology. What is it about these dark and mysterious worlds that fascinates you? Well, there's something I grew up with. My mum's Irish, um, so when I was growing up I heard a lot of Irish legends and folk tales and whatnot. And I guess they stuck with me and inspired me to sort of explore the, the folk tales of other cultures as well. I think when you're writing, sometimes there's a tendency to focus very much on self um, and just write about your own experiences and that's not necessarily that interesting to to other people so I initially started writing about them as a way of sort of broadening things out you know giving a wider focus and possibly talking about things I wanted to talk about through the vehicle of another story. Now we glimpse her sometimes moving between tree trunks across clearings wary at a distance. Her hooves leave tracks like tidy hearts behind. She vanishes, silent, among leaves, dapples of light. We don't think she knows us any more. Lear's Children is probably my very favourite one, which again is about a, a Celtic fairy tale, about a king um, whose children were turned into swans by his second wife, the children of his first wife. And again, well, I'm interested in the themes of it. It's about transformation, obviously. But it's just one where the words seem to come together very easily. You know, the first draft came very easily and I didn't have to do a lot of tweaking. I just felt it arrived in the a format I was happy with. The lake's dark. Its mists have fingers. Last year it drowned a girl. The water cleans her bones, lapping like cats. We float and are cold. Our feet catch like oars in the weed. Time passes slowly when you have no words. It is hard to accustom oneself to a diet of tubers, of submerged plants, to the weight and prickle of feathers. We are white and still. When we dive, it is gloomy and bony. When we fly, we ascend from a kingdom's cares, a father's mourning. Our wings batter the sky. We shake off the water like stars. I think myth and legend are relevant to our everyday lives in that they're a way of talking about things that otherwise might be difficult to talk about. Um, they're another way of sort of, another language if you like, another vocabulary for talking about things that are relevant to us in our everyday lives. And they're full of archetypal characters and situations that have some kind of a resonance through all cultures and all times, I guess. Your poems depict a dark and mysterious world. Is there light at the end of the tunnel? Do you think <laughs> you're an optimist? 
Well, I think in the world of the book, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And that's when I talked before about there being a kind of narrative through the book. I think the, the narrative takes you towards the light. You know, it's about regeneration and renewal and transformation in that positive sense. In terms of whether I think in the world um, there's cause for optimism, I think we're living in very difficult, um, troubling times. And on an individual level, there's cause for optimism. You know, there's people doing extraordinary work to support others. But at the level of sort of international politics, you know, we don't appear to be living in an age of, of great hope. Well, that's what it seems to me. Why have you given your collection the title Seal Wife? Well, Seal Wife is one of the poems in the collection. Um, and I guess for me, it was the one that sort of distilled what the whole thing's about. Um, partly because the book is dedicated to my husband um, and there's a lot of poems about wives in there. So it seemed appropriate. Um, but also that is a poem that's about, you know, the things we've said, transformation and longing and whatnot. Um, and it is based on a, a Celtic myth, um, the idea of the Selkie, a woman who is a, a seal but turns into a human. The grass is aching with frost. Birds fall, small toys, from the trees in their deaths. This cold is murderous. In the churchyard, the drowned walk at noon as if it were night. They return to old beds, slip in by their frozen wives. And I am numbing myself, with my baking, my stitching, by washing the floors till the stone begins to thin. I hide my face from the mirror, its inquiry threatens. If I could forget, the water could not claim me. How do you set about writing your poetry? Do you need to make notes or is it something you do as a, a regular thing? I do write regularly, um, increasingly so. I didn't used to, but I've got into the habit of it now and I think that's a very useful habit to have. I don't have a particularly conscious process for writing. Lines just appear to me, if you like, um, and when I set them down on paper, then more lines flow from them until I've got a complete poem. And that's the first draft, and I would generally leave that for a while and come back to it and refine it, you know, um, tweak it around and substitute words for other words and so on and do that a number of times until there's a, a finished product which either is suitable to be released to the world or, or not. You know, I might think it's rubbish and it never sees the light of day. Um, but it's not a, a conscious process. I can't think to myself, oh, I'm going to write today about X, Y, Z and sit down and do it. I have to wait for the ideas to come to me. But I think by writing regularly, you get yourself into that headspace where that does happen. Do you find inspiration does come quite easily or surprisingly to you? I used to wait for inspiration to strike, um, and it didn't strike very often. But I think once you get that into your head that you're going to write, I mean, I write every week. I write a, at least one poem every week. So all week I'm kind of mulling over, I guess, what's going to be in my head this week and what am I going to write about? And something flows from that usually. Um, and I think just being alive to other writers, you know, reading a lot, um, being alive to what's going on in the world and on the news and interested in other people and their lives, you know, that gives you lots of subject matter to, to think over and write about. Kitty Coles was talking to Anne Jones about her new collection of poems entitled Seal Wife, published by Indigo Dreams and available from Amazon, or by going to Kitty Coles' website, which is on the screen now. Well, 160 years ago, almost to the day, if you're watching this edition in April 2018, a remarkable woman was born, Ethel Smythe. Smythe was to spend much of her life composing, writing and championing women's rights. She moved to Woking in the last years of her life, not far from us here in Perford. While she is remembered for her political activism and music, she was also a great sportswoman, playing golf to a high standard at Woking Golf Club. And it was there, at the club, situated in Leafy Hook Heath, that I met up with Dr Chris Wiley, commentator and authority on this groundbreaking and revolutionary woman. I began by asking him if golf was Smythe's only sporting passion. Certainly not her only one, no. I'm 
perhaps it was her main passion and that's why she had her house built adjacent to the golf course but she was also a keen tennis player mm -hmm. she's a cricket uh, horse riding and hunting mm -hmm. she's a keen dog walker she had a, a string of old english sheep dogs for several decades and they were all called pan <laughs> uh, and a climber as well Oh, and climbed in, in um, Europe or in yes, Scotland? Yes, um, one of her um, books is a three-legged tour in Greece. Uh, it's about a, a holiday she undertook with her great-niece in Greece in the 1920s. And she talks about, you know, she, she's a woman that then approaching her 70s and she talks about clambering over these rock faces just for the sake of taking a shortcut. Parents. She moved to Hook Heath in 1910, having had the, the house built adjacent to the golf course. Um, and there was a, a, obviously a gentleman's club at the time, but also a ladies' club. Uh, there was some overlap between the two, so the, the number of the ladies, for instance, their husbands were also members and that had brought them within the walls of the club. Um, Smythe tended to regard them as, as separate identities. She regarded women more as temporary members, but, but then she was a, of a certain <laughs> persuasion politically and, and, and may have been uh, more inclined to think in those ways. Her music spans many years of her life, of course. Um, she was educated in the, the, the 19th century German and Austro-Germanic Austro ways of writing music. Uh, if we look at one of her early large-scale works, like the Mass in D, it's clearly quite indebted to Beethoven. Beethoven also wrote a Mass, the Mrs. Solemnis. It's also in the key of D that the two have been favourably compared. And something that I'm, I'm amazed by is uh, she's still composing in the 1920s, by then, she was really quite severely hard of hearing. Um, and, and she's still being quite innovative in terms of the musical language that she's using and the techniques that she's using. Let's talk about her damehood, because that was very much uh, as a result of her activities here at the Woking Golf Club. She ascribes her damehood to the Woking Golf Club, yes. Uh, the Woking Golf Club was obviously quite an elite uh, club and attracted um, certain gentlemen from London, one of whom was Lord Riddell, who uh, owned the News of the World at the time. Uh, he was also a close friend of David Lloyd George, who was then Prime Minister. And when Lord Riddell came to the golf club, he, he was familiar with Ethel Smythe and heard the name. And as the New Year's honours rolled round, she discovered that she'd been made a dame, and that was in 1922, all thanks to Woking Golf Club. Well, she seems to have been a, quite a formidable opponent in golf, as in life generally. Uh, famously, she was proud never to have lost a golf ball on the Woking Golf Club, uh, which suggests, I mean, tells us something about her golf playing. She seems to have been a, a relatively safe player, would not hit balls long distances, uh, would, would hit them fairly straight. She was also known to send caddies back to cut the heather down if the heather refused to give up one of her golf balls just to maintain this perfect record of never having lost a ball. How much of a sacrifice was it for Smythe to, to leave the music world where she'd accrued or beginning to accrue a reputation and go into another part of, of human activity, i.e. To, to join the cause, the, the suffragettes? I think by 1910, when she heard Emmeline Panker speak and, and resolved to devote two years of her life to the suffragettes' cause, uh, she, she'd accrued quite a reputation in music. Her musical and compositional activities didn't completely cease at the time. Um, we see this in some of her music, some of the songs, for instance, through the dedications, through the suffrage texts, uh, through the synopses. Uh, nowhere more do we see it than the March of the Women, the suffragette anthem. Back in 1910, the suffragettes did not have a song that they could call their own, that they could sing on marches, that they could uh, sing to console themselves to bolster morale whilst in prison during the hunger strikings, for instance. And Smythe pr provided them with that anthem in the March of the Women. How did Smythe cope with prison life? I'm thinking of her time in Holloway. Uh, she seemed to have fared reasonably well. It was one of the more comfortable times for suffragettes in prison. If, if any time in prison is comfortable, it, it was a time when they weren't hunger striking. Uh, the warden seems to have been sympathetic by reports. She would forget, to conveniently forget to lock the doors of the cells, enabling Smythe to take afternoon tea with Emmeline Pankhurst. Uh, and there's a lovely story of uh, uh, one visit by the conductor Thomas Beecham to Smythe while she was in prison. Uh, where the suffragettes were exercising in the yard below and singing the March of the Women and Smythe had her hand thrust through the 
bars of her cell window and was frantically trying to keep them in time, <laughs> conducting using her toothbrush as a makeshift pattern. So how will Smythe be remembered? As a composer, as a writer? Will history judge her kindly, do you think? I, I think so, yes. I, I hope so. Um, certainly she's, uh, history's been kind to her recently in terms of music. She's received a, a number of performances and broadcasts and recordings. Uh, equally well in, in terms of literature. Uh, her literary writings brought her into contact with the likes of Virginia Woolf, which brings her to the attention of whole new audiences who have never heard her music. Um, probably her greatest impact was The Suffragette, uh, and the March of the Women, a song that was and is known to millions of people. Uh, and it's lovely to remember her for another reason today, to think of her as a, a sports person and, and as a passionate golfer. If she was alive today, mm -hmm. what would she be campaigning for? What cause would she be supporting and, and helping move forward, would you say? Um, I suspect she'd be quite vocal. She was always quite self-serving whenever in her literature when she's talking about music and opportunities for music composition and women within music composition. The sense that one gets is she's really talking about herself primarily or exclusively. Um, but I suspect I mean, she was, um, you know, the BBC were, were um, engaging in early broadcasts, early radio broadcasts, and she was involved in that. I, I suspect she'd be quite in demand as a spokesperson these days. She'd be there on, on breakfast television sofas, for instance, giving her opinions on any and all topics. And then at the end of her life, where was she buried? Uh, she was actually cremated, and at, at her request, her ashes were spread in the woodlands around this golf club in recognition of her passion for the sport and for the club in particular. Dr Chris Wiley was talking to me about the life of Dame Ethel Smythe, a resident of Woking and champion of women's rights. And there's a chance to learn more of this remarkable woman when he delivers a talk on Dame Ethel at the Surrey History Centre on the 3rd of September. And what a lovely setting Woking Golf Club is. Special thanks to Richard Pennell and the team at the Golf Club for all their help and support during the filming of that interview. The March of the Women Music was kindly provided by Retrospect Opera, who specialise in recording opera from the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries. Anne Jones was the researcher and Paul Van Zibrook was on camera. Now, it's not every day that Perfect TV gets a chance to nip down to the social. That's the social club set behind Perford Village Hall. It's a popular venue and watering hole for Perfordites, especially on open mic nights on the last Thursday of the month. It was there a short while ago that Ian Wishart chose to premiere his new composition with the original title, The Perford Song. It was caught on a smartphone by a member of the uh, <coughs> research team. I thought you'd enjoy it too. Mark Hannington joins Ian on guitar. Some people like to go to Guildford, some people like to go to Saint. I once made a trip to Woking and I ain't never going there again. Some people like to shop in Weybridge, others like Wisley, Aerodrome's brief. I spent half a day in Cobham and I was very, very pleased to get back on. Cos it's perfect, the place for me. No other place in Surrey where I'd ever want to be You can keep your rabbit, your hammer and your wool in on Thames I'm staying in Perfect with all of my friends Cos it's Perfect, the place to be gu 22 No Amsterdam, no Arkham, no Arkham or I live in Perfect and I'm happy here Got the hang of it Well, some people like to go to Claygate, but why they want to do that, ever knows. Claygate's even worse than he shut. He hasn't even got a colour Lucio's. He's got Sean Mill and Appley Phil. I'm telling you, Burford's better still. Wooden's alright, to be fair, till they build a thousand new homes there. Haha, <laughs> local politics. So it's Burford, the best for me. No other place is sorry where I'd ever want to be You can keep your rabbit, your hammer and your woven on tents I'm 
stain of purple and we don't have any friends cause it's perfect Yes to be GU 2280G No Amsterdam, no Warshaw, no Walking or shit I live in Perfect and I'm happy here So come on in, what's, uh, what's the big deal about Perfect? <laughs> Well, it's a busy little church and a primary school and an annual flower show that's a really rather cool. There's a cricket club and a village hall and in the Arbor Centre you can have a ball, literally. We got a butcher shop and a little co-op and a baker's that will sell you bread that's hot. You got a choice of two if you want your hair cut. Though it's never been the same since the trophy shop shut. Aww. And the post office. Well, yeah. And the chemists. Oh, yeah. And the dry cleaners. You forgot about that one, didn't you? Yeah. But it's perfect. A place for me. No other place is how we learn. Ever wanna be. You can keep your rabbit, your hammer, and your woman on tennis. I'm staying in purple with all of my friends. Cause it's purple. The place to be. GU2280G. There's even a social club that serves good beer. Three bad boy, quite good value. <laughs> we live in Burford and we're happy here. I live in Burford and I'm happy here. The Perford song featuring Perford's answer to Chas and Dave. Ian Wishart on keyboards and Mark Hannington on guitar. Three pounds a pint. I might switch from Pina Grigio. Well, that, alas, brings us to the end of this, the first edition of the year. Perfect TV Arts will be back in the summer with, among other things, a walk round Brookwood Cemetery to discover the last resting place of many World War I soldiers who called Woking their home. We've an art gallery to discover and some drama to enjoy, so I do hope you can join us then. Thanks to all our contributors to the programme today and, of course, to the team backstage. And thank you for watching. I'm Tim Matthews. We'll see you in the summer. Goodbye.